Hey guys, this is Allie with Softball Youth here for our very first um, a leaders focused team huddle. Um, we got to steal a little bit of Lacey's time just for you guys to answer your questions and talk a little more specific high end recruiting types of conversations. Um, you know me by now, I won't go through my whole spiel. You guys know Alicia, um, but Lacey, a little bit of background on her. Um, don't fangirl too much. Um, I've had a little bit of that. She was a really, really amazing pitcher and um, someone that I've loved watching every year when I went to the World Series. So it's, uh, it's an honor to have you. Lacey, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Um, it's not so, all the time to hear that praise, but appreciate well, it. Well, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Um, just a little bit of um, bio on Lacey. Um, obviously, she went to Florida State. I'll run through all of the accolades. Two-time ACC Pitcher of the Year, 16 ACC Player of the Week, three-time All-Region, three-time All-American, 2014 USA Softball National Player of the Year. That is, to me, um, I don't know about how you feel about specific accolades, but that one is just such a special thing, and I think extra special for a pitcher to get it, which is really crazy. And um, 2015 Lowe's Senior Class Award. Leaders, if you guys don't know what the um, Lowe's Senior Class Award is, you should Google it right now. It is a really, really big honor. Um, encompasses way more than just your play on the field, which is um, pretty incredible. Um, several records at uh, Florida State, first in wins, second in appearances, third in strikeouts, and fourth in saves. Um, Lacey was a third round draft pick and had back-to-back -back championships with the Bandits. Um, had some coaching stints at Oklahoma and Duke. And um, now is the face of Softball Rebellion, which is a really unbelievable training facility. They do lots of awesome stuff. I'll let her talk about that. But let's dive right into some recruiting specific conversations because that's really what we've been um, catering to our elite family that these kids all want to play at a high level and um, are really doing what it takes and trying to learn what it takes to make that happen. So Lacey, why don't you give us just a, you know, a little bit of a backstory on your recruiting journey. Um, I know you're from Virginia, but obviously everybody might not, how you ended up at Florida State. East Coast recruiting is very different. Did you have a dream school? Like, give me a little bit about what did that look like for you? Yeah, so I think around probably eighth grade is when I really realized that I was in softball for the long haul and really wanted to do something with it as far as playing in college. So funny enough, my dream school growing up was Texas because I loved watching Kat Osterman. She was my favorite pitcher, loved to watch her move the ball around, which you know worked out for me because I was more of a movement pitcher than a power pitcher. So loved watching her and that was always my dream. And that dream continued to morph throughout the years. So even funnier, after thinking of Texas was my dream school, I was like, I love Florida, which, as a Seminole, you're like, oh, how did you love Florida? But I had no ties to any schools. My parents didn't go to college. Neither of them played sports. So we really didn't watch a ton of sports growing up. I didn't have a favorite team other than just watching softball. So I started to look at schools based on the programs that they offered for school because I wanted to be a marine biologist at the time. Definitely not a green biologist right now, but Very still interesting. There are not a lot of Division One programs. Um, right. I know from you know recruiting that there's not a lot out there, so it's tough to find. Yeah, so that's how I kind of narrowed down the schools that I wanted to email and I wanted to send my recruiting video to. It was on a DVD back then. We were talking about this yesterday, but now everybody just sends them online. Mine is still. VHS. <laughs> yes. So you guys have it easy now. Uh, you just upload it to YouTube and you're good. Um, but that was how I decided, okay, these are my 10 schools. They all have marine biology programs and, and things like that. So I sent my video to Florida State. That's how Coach o really started watching me and liked what she saw. And then because so correct of that- correct me if I'm wrong, these 10 <laughs> schools that you narrowed, they did or they did not show a bunch of interest in you prior to you reaching out to them? They actually didn't. So this was at the time where recruiting wasn't done quite as early. Yep. So I was pretty early in figuring out, okay, these are the schools that I want to send my video to. Um, and I was probably a sophomore and had just really started to play on an elite level travel team. I had played locally up until that point. Right. Um, so once I started playing at a higher level and I actually played for the New Jersey Pride and the New Jersey Intensity, which is where I got most of my exposure, that's when I decided to send out those letters. So a lot of schools really hadn't seen it yet. I just kind of wanted to show them what I had to offer in terms of video. And luckily, Coach liked it. And that's she 
told me that as soon as I met her. It was like, hey, I really like that you spun the ball on the video, I can tell. And that's how she started to recruit me. That's an awesome story because Alicia and I have been preaching how important it is to one, get vid quality video up. Um, and two, do you think they're just going, these schools are just going to come to you and knock on your door? Ask your parents, when's the last time someone <laughs> came and knocked on your door and offered you a job? Right? right. It just doesn't happen that way. Right. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. We talked about also, you know, making that divide from like your local teams into a known, well-known powerhouse um, softball organization. I mean, New Jersey intensity is very well known. And, you know, we tell kids a lot that you have to break those ties sometimes playing with those, you know, same group of girls and the same dads from eight and under all the way up is really hard to do. So once you branch off to that, obviously it helps. Absolutely. And I think it was definitely hard. I had played with my best friends growing up from the time I was 10 to the time I was 14. And, and we did really well locally. We were a yeah. well-known team in Virginia, but that didn't really expand to the schools that I wanted to consider going to. Um, I never, I, for whatever reason, I had never really thought about staying local. I always wanted to go far. So for me, it made sense if I wanted to compete at a higher level, I knew I needed to go on to another team. And it was awesome. Just the difference from my local team to the New Jersey intensity in one weekend. I was like, this is amazing. It is incredible. Uh, That's awesome. You talk about going away from home because I think it sounds like on the last few Ask Alleys, I've talked a lot about coaching in Texas. Kids rarely, rarely are willing to leave the state. They really like Texas. And I did too. I loved it. I lived there for almost 10 years. Um, but it's a big globe and tons of opportunities. And Alicia and I both went far from home and now we live places far from home. Um, so that's, I just think it's great advice to explore all options and see what's out there before you cut yourself off just based on geographics, because you just have no idea how beautiful of an experience that can be unless you at least open yourself up to the possibility. Definitely. And I think just creating some independence is such a huge part of that. And you'll be thankful for that later in your life. And at the time when I started playing with the intensity, my parents would send me on a train and I'd go up and I'd go to the tournaments that way. They couldn't always come with me. So that made me grow up. I got really cool experience from that. And then once I was in college, I was like, oh, this is no big deal. Like I've kind of been on my own before. I know what this is like. And it really prepared me to take on bigger things and not be scared of the world in a way, but know that, hey, it's good to branch out. Awesome. Yep. That's, that's all awesome feedback. So we're going to um, jump into some of the Elita's questions. Alicia's going to kind of take it from here and we can obviously um, talk through some of these things. I'm sure things are going to come up and we'll kind of go with it, but let's definitely get to some of, um, we had a lot of really great questions. I funneled it into a few that I thought were really um, good and relevant, but Alicia, go ahead. Yeah, so it was great because a lot of the questions have to do with pitching. So I think that's great that a lot of girls know exactly who you are. So I knew you would probably like that. But for the first question, as you progress as a pitcher and learn more and more pitches, what would you recommend as ways to find and develop your go-to strikeout pitch? So I, with that, I think it's really important to understand your natural strength. And to me, that's what makes the great pitchers great is they don't try to be someone they're not. They really understand what they do well, and then they fine tune that. So they're not going and saying, I need to add this pitch and I need to add that pitch, but okay, well, I knew growing up, I had really good top spin. So I was gonna be a drop ball pitcher and I had a really good change up. So I stayed with those for honestly, probably up until I was a freshman in high school. And then I started to learn a curveball that kind of came to me pretty well and then went from there. But in college, those were my main three pitches and I would occasionally throw a rise ball. So really take the time to figure out what do you do well? How do you get people out? So if you get a lot of ground balls, a lot of weak hits, things like that, you maybe you developed a lot of good top spin. Um, if you have a great changeup, keep using the changeup. I think that's one thing that's not used enough. Oh my off speed gosh. is so important. Off speed. Yes. And if you even have a third off speed, like a, let's say you have your fastball, your changeup, if you can have something in between, you are super dangerous. So I would say if you're trying to figure out, okay, what do I go to next? I know I have these two great pitches maybe try to find something in between. That would be my best advice I would give someone because as a hitter, I'm sure you guys know, like if I don't know what speed is coming at me, and I have three <laughs> to choose from, that's tough. 
It's hard. And correct me, I mean, the, the way I always looked at that, when you say to um, working to your strengths, if I have a kid at camp that comes in and they say their best pitch is a curveball and a rise ball, not that it's impossible, but I would be surprised because mm -hmm. drop ball pitchers lend better to curveballs and screwball pitchers lend better to rise balls. Mm -hmm. So I think that even basic, that sounds basic, but it's just not when you're growing up and you have pitching coaches and you have coaches forcing you to throw seven pitches. If right. your body is more forward, is more back when you like all of those things really need to be reined in to focus on what you what your body is set up to be able to do best yes for sure and i do think the interesting thing about the curveball is with that one it could potentially if lend you to throw a palm up curve yes right so oh, but right. a lot of people think they throw a palm up curveball and they don't right so this is where i think technology becomes so important for you to understand what does your ball actually do and how do you make that better? Because you may think, oh, my best pitch is a rise ball. And if you got on the Rapsodo or the Diamond Kinetics ball, like I've had a lot of kids who think their best pitch is the rise ball and it's still spinning and their down. Are right. Yeah, so it's really important. Those things are very accessible now. It's really important to use them. Is that what you guys use at Adam yeah. Couple Rebellion? What are the tools that you guys work with? Yeah, so we, I like Rapsodo a lot um, for the initial eval because it gives me a lot of information. We can just get rolling and it gives me a report when they're done that I can look through and then I'll give them um, their analysis on their pitches after that's over. Awesome. Um, during lessons, I love the Diamond Kinetics because there's a feature where you can actually set your iPad up. It'll get video and kind of clip that video in line with your pitch so you can see the video and your numbers, which I think is really helpful for girls because immediately they can see that visual of, oh, this is what my hand did. That makes sense as to why the ball spun this way. That's awesome. And you guys are doing with, um, you're talking about um, getting video and, and looking at, you guys are doing some of that kind of stuff now remotely, right? Yes, so we actually partnered with Diamond Kinetics um, on both the hitting and the pitching side. So. Softball Rebellion came from Baseball Rebellion, which has been around for a long time. Amazing hitting instruction. If any of you guys that are, are watching this don't know about it, some really high-end hitting stuff on there. I yeah. love it. So Chaz has known JD with Diamond Kinetics for a long time. So they got together, made this package where you can get online hitting analysis with us and a swing tracker from Diamond Kinetics. And then the same thing on the pitching side where you That's can awesome. get a tracker ball and then an online analysis with me and it's really cheap it's like a hundred bucks for the ball and analysis so anybody that doesn't know how inexpensive that is, that um, is do your research that's a pretty that's a pretty good gig if any of you guys are interested in that um we'll we'll post some of this stuff in the elite group so you guys can just check out some of those resources yes definitely okay going to the second question um when going to showcase tournaments and camps what are ways to help stand out in front of coaches um, I think you have to be yourself. I think so often when I was coaching in college, girls, they just wanted to listen, but they didn't want to speak. So I didn't know much about them. It's like, okay, well. My kids said too much all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so they would, you know, they'd go through the drills and obviously you're going to notice someone if they're very good, right? But let's say that you're kind of blending in or, you know, there's a couple people that are maybe a little bit better than you at the camp your way to stand out is to engage with the coaches and engage with the players because a lot of times the players are working at these camps and they're writing down names that they remember. So if you're memorable, whether it's from your play or you just asked a lot of really great questions, you were really engaged, you hustled, people are gonna remember you for that. So whatever you do well and you think I think I always go back to what you do well, yeah. but what makes you special as a player, whether that's your energy, you hustle, things like that, do that and make it known that you're going to do that every single time and someone will notice you. Yes, the athletic ability comes first for sure, but if you're willing to get out there and get out of your comfort zone, I think that's a huge thing that not a lot of people are willing to do. Yeah, for sure. I remember at Louisville when we did our camps, I would always remember the kids who wore like bright color socks. I'm like, did you see the girl with the hot pink socks? She was running around like crazy, like things like that. I'm sure you guys both remember campers in like bright colors or something. I always tell my girls, do something else. Everyone wears your jersey. Mm -hmm. How are you going to stand out? So 
You know what always really got me was when there would be BP session during camp and there's a kid diving in the outfield and legitimately yeah. shagging balls. That's, that's big time. That is like such high level stuff and a really great way to stick around, st stick out because there, you'll see groups of five kids like standing around talking to each other and you're missing opportunities to make great plays. You might get five balls in a scrimmage or a game. You might get yeah. none, but you're guaranteed to get a ton on BP. So use them, right? Absolutely. And I think that's something too, that it just shows that you're competitive. If yeah. you're going out there and, and catching you love playing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the kind of kid that I want. And sometimes the competitiveness, I think, outweighs the talent no because doubt. we have people that are talented, but they just, they just kind of go out there, don't really care. That always drove me nuts. Like I want someone who's going to compete every single time, whether it's pitching, hitting, no matter what, they love playing and they're passionate about it. Yeah, like spurting out to your position in games, like racing your teammates, things like that are super fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. What practice advice do you have for travel ball players, especially pitchers? Okay, practice advice. That's pretty important. And actually, I was going to, I was thinking about this earlier, just because I know I saw someone mention what are the favorite pitching drills and things like that. And really to me, there's no like cookie cutter drills or cookie cutter practice that is specialized for every person out there. I think you really have to decide and be detailed. This is what I want to get better at today and be very diligent about it. So yes, usually coaches plan practice, but I think as a player, if you take it upon yourself to say, okay, well today I want to get better at these two things. And you know that every rep you're taking, taking, you're doing those things, you're going to get better. So I would say make a plan and probably a goal to set before practice and then structure it out. I'm a huge planner. So if I know I'm going to work on some things, especially right now when we're in quarantine and like you have some time, okay, I want to do this for 15 minutes and then I want to do that and just structure it out based on one, I'm going to always go back to your strength. So continue to improve your strength, but then also pick something that you're not so good at that you know needs work and spend some time on that as well. What are your, um, speaking of practice, do you have, let's talk to the youth space, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, 10s and 12s, and maybe maybe a 12, the 12 you kids have been pitching for four years, but do you have a, um, a personal opinion on pitches per day, pitch count type of conversation? I do, I do so... It goes back to me to it's not necessarily a blanket for everyone because there are certain pitchers who mechanically they do things very well, they move very well, and they're going to be capable of throwing a lot more than someone whose mechanics break down really quickly. Because when you get yourself into certain positions, you're at higher risk for injury always. Yeah. So the more you throw, the more risky it is. So I think you can do a lot of things at a young age that will make you better without having to throw a ton of pitches every day. So I think as a young pitcher, you should always include strength and conditioning in that. You should always have a proper warm up because for one thing, I think a lot of kids, they start warming up with throwing. They don't actually do a dynamic. So it takes them so many more repetitions to get loose Right. Instead of actually doing a dynamic warm up, being right by the time you start doing any softball specific activity, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Whether it's overhand throwing, underhand, anything. Nobody likes running laps and nobody likes doing agilities. It's the worst part of practice and it gets worse in college, I promise you. It's like the worst 15 minutes of your life. Oh, but if you can oh. just bang it out and get it done in a short amount of time and get moving, it's just so much better for your body and, like you said, your muscles and the ability yeah. to do that. I, yeah. I remember at um, the convention several years ago, um, Washington pitching coach was speaking and it was really interesting. I mean, when you're talking about pinnacle programs versus the rest of the world, I think that it's a little bit different, right? We can all understand that there are freaks of nature that are gifted in so many ways and obviously work very hard, but are just given things that some people aren't. But he spoke on their in-season and preseason workouts and how often and how much and it was incredible they basically had um a like four to one three to one two to one type structure like mm -hmm. um if you were a field player that did pitch you were four to one so you threw once every four days if you were a mid you know like their 
preseason pitcher, you were mm -hmm. three to one every three days. And some of their top one, two, even three pitchers were not throwing, they were throwing full pitches like once a week. Mm -hmm. That is, in, to me, coaching at a mid-major and being a mid-major athlete myself, the idea of doing something full once a week blows my mind. But yeah. I think that's yeah. difference in philosophy too and difference in obviously natural scalability and what they right. have. Tools. Yeah, that, that is a little crazy to me too. One day yeah. a week, I would not have expected that. Um, but that's something that pitch it, was, pitch, they work out. Right, it's going full blown bullpens. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, and I think it goes back to like if you prepare your body, you're gonna be able to do it. But I also think for just anyone you're going to be able to pitch more if you slowly improve and increase the amount of volume you're doing instead of where you really struggle, I think, is when you go from not pitching a lot to pitching a lot and it's all thrown at you and that's where you get the injuries and things like that. So as long as your body's prepared for it and you've progressively done it, I think you're good. Um, and where you really start to look at it from a young age is figuring out where are you movement deficient? How can you improve that? So that then you can get to where you can throw more pitches and stay longer in games and not break down. I always really worried about um, kids that I recruited that had to pitch in high school because they were the best athletes yeah. on their teams mm -hmm. and they weren't full-time pitchers. And, you know, it, and I loved athletes that played multiple sports. So then we would be in the situation where they're playing, you know, winter basketball and then, oh, it's time to get ready for pitching. Oh my God, I better start throwing five days a week. And I'm like, oh, this is like the, it, the whole thing was scary. Yeah. You know, so I, I really encourage like all the athletes watching to hear what Lacey's saying about building and, you know, fitness and taking care of your body and be smart. Different. Sports. Yes. Yes. And it, it's, it's a lot easier to get through four years as a full-time everyday starter or a player off of the bench. It's all so hard on your body and it's just so much easier if you take care of it and you fuel it and you, you know, you train it the right way. Absolutely. Alrighty, so a lot of these questions we already have gone over, you talking about your experiences and you picking out your college, but I want to know what was your day from the moment you woke up, the moment you went to bed as a college athlete? What was that like? Um, let's see. It was a couple of years ago, so I have to <laughs> really think back to this. Um, so we usually, let's, let's, we'll go through a fall day and then a spring yeah. day. Oh yeah, yeah spring Typically in the fall, when we were in our, let's say, 20-hour weeks, we usually would lift. We Which have explain what that means, Lacey. Explain what a 20-hour week means. So a 20-hour week for, that could be in the spring or the fall, basically means you have you, your full amount of training. That's the most you'll ever have throughout the week to get in your practice time. That also includes meeting, strength and conditioning, all those things. The time team practices. Right, team practices, you're basically out of individual time and you're really working together as a team. Um, so that's what that means. There's also eight hour weeks, which are when you're in your individual time. So basically it's just you one-on-one -on -one with your coach and those are usually broken into like 30 minute sessions or so that you'll have a couple of times a week. Um, but when we were in our 20 hours in the fall, we would usually have three groups of lifting. So either you had a six o'clock time, a seven o'clock time, an eight o'clock time in the morning. And, and that was based on your class schedule. Yes, exactly. Lucky um, you guys. Times, yes, a lot of times the seniors, like when I was a senior, I didn't have to lift until eight because I only had two classes in the spring and I think four in the fall. So I got to lift later, which was nice. Got a little extra sleep, which is super important. Um, so I'd lift at eight, lift for about an hour and then go to class. Usually you might have two or three classes a day. Um, go to lunch at training table. So let's say lunch is around 12 or whenever you have time between classes. I was going to say, you got to eat lunch? Yeah, what's lunch? Yeah, I try to bring snacks. Like I said, this is my senior year, so I had right. a little bit more time. And you, um, learn, you learn how to manage your time better. Yes, for sure. So when I was a freshman, I think that was super overwhelming. Um, figured it out eventually, for sure. Took lots of little like 20 minute naps here and there when I could. Um, so after lunch, if I had time for that, you, we'd all typically go to the locker room and practice was normally around two or two 30, but something that was a staple at FSU is we were all always on the field early, just getting extra reps, hitting them to each other 
And it usually, maybe I wouldn't pitch, but I always wanted PFP. I always wanted ground balls. So we would be there, you know, 30 minutes, an hour early, just taking reps. No one had to ask us to do it. That's just what we liked to do and what our seniors did. So everybody kind of fell in line, which was awesome. tradition. Yep. Yes. And being a coach now, I realized that that doesn't happen everywhere. And you really have to build that from the player's side to make that happen. So that was really cool. Um, we'd usually practice then for about three hours. So our practice schedule was generally the same, which I really enjoyed. We would always start with either BP or defense. So let's say we started with BP for the day. We'd go through that about an hour at different groups. The pitchers would throw during that time. And when you were done throwing, you'd shag in the outfield. Also another highlight that I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then from there, We'd go into team defense, cuts and relays, things like that. Tons of defense work. Um, Coach and the other coaches were really big on rundowns. So we worked on rundowns a ton. And then after practice was over, usually you would either, sometimes I had a late class. So there were times that I'd have to go back to class after that. Um, but if not, you're going to go get a meal, have a good dinner, and then come back, do a little homework, go to bed. And a couple of things that it sounds like you fortunately were not in the training room a lot because mm -hmm. you would have definitely mentioned that if you had to spend a lot of time in the training room, mm -hmm. that can be before or after practice or both. Yep. Um, didn't mention any mandatory ice baths a couple of times a week. Did not mention study hall. Lacey was an incredible student. Not all of us were so lucky. I did have tutoring. That's one thing I forgot to mention. There are times I have tutoring after practice. And then what's your spring, what was your spring day like? So spring, um, it was relatively similar, but obviously you're going to have less practice, more games. So let's say it's a midweek. Usually we wouldn't lift during a midweek, but I really like to go in and do some like small lifting things before game days. So just light, quick stuff with our trainer. So once I got done with class in the morning, I would usually go do that then have a couple hours before game time. You'll have lunch at the field, which is really nice. Pre-game starting about two hours before. Sometimes we would do show and go, so we'd get there like 45 minutes before the game. Sometimes other teams didn't like that, but it was just great for us because we did not like to sit around. So it helped. Yeah, it's bad for scheduling. Yep, it's terrible. Yeah. So <laughs> it's time. <laughs> I know, I know. As a coach now, I can understand. But as a player, I'm like, oh, this is great. Why, why is anybody upset? But then we'd have the game, go back. And again, you might have tutoring after you have a softball game that night, just depending on the day. Um, and let's say sometimes midweeks could roll into you have a travel day the next day. So we played a game. All right, now we are going to California, to Palm Springs. So we're leaving in the morning at 9 o'clock flying across the country and then play the next day. It all tends to happen really fast, but if you're enjoying it, you almost don't realize like how quickly it all goes just because you're so invested in what you're doing. You're like, oh, my days aren't that busy. I'm just having fun. The last yeah, two no other way. Just, it's just the it's, way of life. It's so interesting because the last two questions on here that we have, which yeah. we can definitely get to, um, really tie in exactly what we were just talking about. You were like, oh, freshman, I was so overwhelmed and yeah. And if you're having fun, well, a lot of times freshman fall is the most excruciating thing you will ever do in your entire life. And you will probably consider quitting more than once. And you'll probably call your parents and cry a lot. But if you can make it past that window, it's then you're golden. An unbelievable <laughs> thing. So Alicia, why don't you talk about that question? Because that's a really good one. To yeah, definitely. Uh, the question is, did you ever have second thoughts during your freshman year about your choice? Yes, I definitely did, which is crazy for me to think about it now because Florida State and the coaches and the culture was so perfect for me. I can't imagine ever being anywhere else. But at the time, just looking back at it now, it didn't seem like that big of changes. It's not like my whole pitching motion was changed or anything like that. But I remember just thinking like, oh my gosh, I don't know I'm if the I'm worst softball it. player ever on the face of the earth. Yeah. I'm terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't. I don't know how to do this. I. I'm terrible. What happened? <laughs> and I wasn't. But you're just thrown into a situation that you're not used to, 
and it's new and you're, you're pushed, like you need to be pushed. I think a lot of times what you don't realize, but when you're being really pushed for the first time, you're like, this doesn't feel great. Yep. And then at the end you realize, okay, that was for the best, but that is really hard to accept in the moment when you've done really well up into that point. So I was in coach's office crying multiple times my freshman year for sure. There were times that it would happen on the field, which crazy to think about now, just with how right. much I know I enjoyed it. But without those moments, I would not have been the pitcher I was later on in my career. So those were huge. And one, my teammates understanding me and how to talk to me, because I don't think I made that very easy because there were times right. where I'd break down, I'd be emotional. And they're like, I don't know how to handle you. And then we figured it out. But if we wouldn't have had those times and those conversations, we wouldn't have been as meshed together and as strong, I think, as a team. So that's something I think that gets overlooked. One, it's okay to have emotion, yes. but two, you have to be willing to talk to your teammates and your coaches and let them help you figure out how to manage it. Right. Agreed. Alicia came in as a slapper and they told her to gain weight and hit home runs. So I think she probably understands all your sentiments oh, and yeah. an all-American leader, it's worth it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's totally worth Absolutely. it. I mean, like, back then, I say back then, and I can't believe I say that, but I, iPhones weren't a thing. I had, like, the slide-up sidekick phone and the ping phone. And phone. <laughs> yeah, and so, face, like, FaceTime wasn't as e you know, we didn't have that. We did Skype. And I remember the amount of times I would call my parents because from a California girl going all the way to Kentucky and I'd be in my dorm and I was 0 for 13 in my first collegiate um, tournament. We actually went to Houston and coach kept me in. And yeah, I mean, the amount of times I doubted myself and cried to my parents. And when I saw my dog for the first time being away from home, <laughs> like, bawling, I mean, just things like that. I, I remember and yeah, it's hard. It, it, it's hard. It's really, really hard, but it's so worth it. Yes. And I think right now too, just growing up, I know I didn't have that many things that like felt that hard, which right. is okay. And I think a lot Agreed. of, a lot of people do have things, hardships that they go through that that prepares them for the future, which is good, but it's, it's not bad. If you don't have those things, you just, you run into it at some point and it's all about how you respond. And I think the people that you surround yourself with really help you. And that's yeah. why picking a school with good coaches is important too. Totally. Great. All right. Last question last for this for session. Yes. Okay. So if you could go back and tell yourself to do one thing differently, what would it be? Ooh. One thing. I think one thing. One thing. Just one. <laughs> that I did not need to be perfect because that was something that always held me back. Just I always wanted to do better and better. And that really got to me my senior year, which I could get into a whole story about that. But it's not about perfection. Enjoy the moment and just be you. That is awesome. awesome. Beautiful. This was great, you guys. Um, so we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, Aliders, thank you so much for your awesome questions. Um, we got to all of the ones I thought were really, really crucial. Um, hopefully, we will, not hopefully, we will definitely be doing this again with Lacey moving forward. Um, I just think Softball Rebellion and Her is just such a beautiful tool that we have access to, and for us not to take full advantage of that is, is crazy. Um, thank you so, so much for being here. Thank and you thank so you so for um, giving you know, our elite group of, of players a even, more specific time with you and it was it was awesome we'll do this again awesome thank you guys so much for having me thank you